Now we can expand that in a couple of ways. We can first talk about man's rationality, his mind, his intellect. That certainly tells us something about a God who is intelligent, personal. It's a rather remarkable thing that we have these minds of ours that accumulate knowledge, that have certain innate principles or orders in the way that we think. Our minds are able to communicate with each other in the use of language. Uh, we form words, sentences, put them into paragraphs. These paragraphs and sentences have logical order. We have inferences that lead to conclusions, or perhaps uh, wrong conclusions, or false inferences. But we nonetheless have these remarkable minds that engage in all these kinds of things. Where does this intellect come from? Can it be uh, explained by s simply the development of chance and atoms and chemicals and that kind of thing? I think most people would recognize that that is an insufficient explanation for love, for knowledge, for communication, for rationality, and these kinds of things. Certainly the chemical makeup of our minds have an influence. When the doctors opened up Ted Kennedy's brain and poked him around a little bit, they could get responses out of him. There are strange things that occur there. But our rationality reflects a rational creator who is an intelligent being. So there's that evidence in the light of nature in man. Our moral nature also gives indication that there is a God who himself is moral, who makes decisions between right and wrong. We all have impressed on our hearts a certain moral fiber, a certain judgment, which distinguishes between right and wrong. No matter what society you enter, you find this kind of moral arbiter in various decisions that are made. There may be slight differences in the way these morals are decided upon, but generally if you take the Ten Commandments, you can pretty well find that all cultures everywhere will recognize those things to be true. It's generally speaking wrong to steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, all these kinds of things most cultures recognize as being immoral. Most cultures have a recognition of an existence of God and an obligation to a God of some form or fashion. And they engage in a wide variety of religious observances towards that God. This is the work of the law on their heart. What is more, not only can they discern between right and wrong, they have a moral conscience that convicts them of when they go wrong. We set up moral authorities and governments. And governments punish criminal behaviors. All these things tend to suggest and make evident that our Creator is a moral God who Himself will judge all mankind. We all have a sense that we must stand before this God and give an account for our behavior. That too indicates the existence of God. Now, in talking about the very light of nature in man, there is much more to consider, but we'll move on to consider the works of creation and providence. David, in the 19th Psalm, talks about how he looks up into the heavens and sees the stars in the sky. As a shepherd, he probably sat out at night and uh, watched the, the stars above, observed the course of the planets and the twinkling of the stars. He saw meteors and asteroids, perhaps comets, flash through the heavens. He saw the moon in its various phases and its progress around the earth. All these many things, the, the sun has made its pass from day to day. All these things impressed him with the fact that there is a God. But interestingly, in the 19th Psalm for David, it was not the bare existence of some abstract deity up there in the heavens. He says specifically the heavens declare the glory 
of God. In other words, the nature of God is revealed in the heavens. Who this God is. You know, we might actually agree with Richard Dawkins and other atheists that there are not gods out there in the world. Because you first of all have to begin by asking the question, which God are you talking about? You have to define your God. And so when you say, ask the question, how does it appear that a God exists? Perhaps you should first begin by asking, what God are you looking for? If you're considering the Hindu God, or the God of the Muslim faith, or some other God like that, the pantheistic God who's a part of the world spirit, then I too am an atheist. In that I say, those are not gods, and they do not exist. What the Catechism is asking is, how does it appear that the infinitely personal triune God of the Christian scriptures exists? That's the God we're asking about. And that's the God that David recognizes in the work of creation. It is this specific God whose glory is manifested in the heavens above. So, we are not arguing simply for some supreme being or an abstract intelligence somewhere out there. But we are speaking of the infinitely personal triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the one God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the heavens and the earth tell us of His glory. They describe His divine nature, His power, His goodness, His wisdom. Paul mentions that as well in Romans chapter 1, where he, he talks about how God has made these things plainly evident to all His creatures. But Paul also recognizes that whereas the glory of God is clearly manifested and impresses upon us our obligation and duty to worship this God and to give Him thanks, the problem is that the human heart suppresses that information. It's plain before Him, it's true, but because of His sinful nature, He does not accept that information. And he tries to explain it away in a wide variety of rationalizations, much like I think Richard Dawkins does. Takes anything that would suggest God and tries to find a way to explain it away. That is what Paul says is our human nature suppressing the truth about God. It's as though some folks have become master politicians as you find on the television set where they come on and they begin their political spin. They take a concept or an idea that is uncomfortable, that's perhaps unflattering to their candidate, and they begin to explain it away. They quickly move to a different subject, they uh, rationalize it away, they cover it up with other kinds of information, they do all kinds of things to hide an unpleasant truth, perhaps, about the candidate. That's what the natural man does with the revelation of God. 